Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, I'd like to start by saying that this is my first time at DEF CON, so I'm really happy to be here. <laughs> and really happy to be able to, to talk to you. Um, I know that the title is a little bit generic, Building the IoT in Smart Buildings, but that's intentional. That's because I want to um, take you through a journey of the research that we did in smart buildings that is uh, culminating in, in, let's say, consumer grade IoT devices in, 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 in smart buildings. But it started with industrial protocols, with BACnet and all of that, and I'll, I'll take you through all of that um, by showing you some of the attacks that we developed, and that's, that's the main uh, focus of the, of the talk today. But first, a little bit about me. So I have a bachelor's and a master's and PhD in computer science. So I have an academic background. I, I have uh, five, more than five years now in, in security, doing some pen testing and mostly academic research also. Right now, I'm a senior researcher at Forescout, and I do vulnerability research for OT and IoT um, environments and devices. Uh, and I also work with network monitoring and intrusion detection for, for OT and IoT. Uh, this presentation, of course, is not just my work. It's the result of uh, more or less a couple of years of research uh, with many collaborators at, at Forescout and also at the University of Eindhoven, where I used to work before. So just bear in mind that this is, this is not something that only I did. Um, so a little bit of motivation. Uh, why are we talking about IoT in smart buildings and IoT in general? So what, what, what are the risks from, from IoT devices, right? So. The number of, of devices in, in organizations is, is rapidly increasing, and I think uh, everybody is aware about that. The, the IoT has already grown a lot in the past decades, and is expected to reach, the numbers vary there, but people say between 20, 30, up to 50 billion connected devices uh, in the next few years. Uh, those devices are mostly unmanaged. They come from, from different vendors. It's, it's not just the usual IT world anymore where we had Windows and Linux and maybe Mac OS. Uh, so we have non-standard operating systems. We have uh, a diversity of uh, protocols. Many of them are insecure. Uh, there are infamous cases of insecure protocols in, in, in building automation. Uh, some of these devices may dynamically connect to other devices. Uh, it could be inside or outside of the organization's network. And there's also an, an, another statistics there that by, by 2020, next year, uh, more than 25% of identified attacks in enterprises will involve the IoT. This, this is a projection, but it's, it's something that could, could, could happen, right? And um, we, there was this report released by, by Microsoft just last week about uh, nation state attackers uh, using IoT devices to, to, to infiltrate in, in, in corporations, right? They're using uh, uh, printers and, and, uh, and, and voice over IP phones and uh, stuff like that, and IP cameras mostly. Uh, but let's talk then about smart buildings. So smart buildings is one of the, of the places where the IoT is uh, rapidly uh, proliferating. Um, so in a smart building, we have several functions. We have uh, lifts, we have surveillance systems, we have fire alarm systems, we have lighting systems, uh, HVAC, so thermostats, fans, we have uh, data centers that have to be cooled, we have uh, surveillance rooms to control the, the, the surveillance systems. And all of these are connected to, to a network and connected to building controllers. Uh, and why? Why would anybody attack smart buildings? Well, first of all, it's, uh, smart buildings are not just uh, uh, shopping malls or, or, or residential buildings or, or something like that. They, they could be very critical buildings like airports, uh, data centers, hospitals, public spaces, even factories. We, we're talking about, uh, we're in the ICS village, right? So the, the, the factories that, that, that host the ICS devices can also be uh, critical buildings that are uh, smart buildings. Um, these building automation systems and smart building networks are many times uh, legacy systems. So some, some of those systems are decades old. Uh, there's many times no encryption, no authentication. It's the same story as, as, as in ICS. But what's happening nowadays is that connectivity is increasing, right? So that there's an increasing attack surface. There are uh, default protocols and open ports, uh, default passwords, weak passwords used in these devices. And all of that creates a, a perfect uh, storm, let's say, for, for, for attackers. Um, so OT, IT, and IoT are all converging in smart buildings. So if you look at a typical smart building network, 
you have a, a management layer where you have workstations, you have IoT platforms, and you have uh, building management workstations <coughs> that are connected and used to, to, to manage all of the field devices and the controller devices and all of that. And then you have separate subsystems, right? You have, for instance, video surveillance with IP cameras and NVRs and, and displays, and then you have uh, the access control systems with badge readers and door locks and, uh, and uh, access control, uh, physical access control controllers. Uh, you have the, the HVAC system, you have the smart lighting system. And then you also have in this, in this whole scenario the consumer grade IoT entry. So you have IoT gateways, you have uh, things like smart plugs, uh, smart TVs, wearables. Uh, in hospitals, you have medical devices, which many times are in the same networks as the as the as the building automation devices. You have other kinds of, of sensors and actuators and smart everything, basically. Uh, and although we will see that later on, but although ideally these networks would not be just flat networks and and things should be isolated and all of that, in many cases in in practice, what we do see is just a flat network where everything is able to communicate to everything else, which is a ideal scenario for for an attack. Um, so what is the the focus of our research? Uh, so we wanted to study vulnerabilities and attacks in in smart buildings. Um, and there are many attacks, uh, attack vectors in, 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 in smart buildings. And we were looking first at building automation systems of the legacy uh, protocols and devices, and then later on the, the consumer grade IoT stuff. Uh, and then some of the attack scenarios that we imagined and some of the things that we implemented are, for instance, in HVAC, changing the, the temperature set points to, I think there was a presentation before talking about BACnet and, and from, from, from the McAfee guys about BACnet and how you can change uh, temperature set points and, and uh, hack HVAC devices so that uh, basically data centers are taken offline or, or in, in hospitals, um, uh, biological or medical material can, can uh, suffer severe consequences. So you also have in, in, in the access control systems, you can uh, add or delete authorized users. In the surveillance system, you can, for instance, delete or, or, or replay footage so that physical intrus in, uh, intrusions can happen. Uh, for the smart lighting systems, you can switch lights uh, on or off or, or continuously on and off and, and basically make them unusable. And for other IoT systems, you can do things like denial of service. You can use them for information gathering, for pivoting in the network and all of that. Um, so on the left-hand side there, what you can see is the, the, the lab that we built for this, uh, this research. And you can see that there is a mix of uh, legacy building automation stuff, so um, uh, workstations and, and industrial-grade uh, uh, building automation controllers using protocols like BACnet and Modbus and uh, KNX and Lontoc and, and others. And you also have uh, IP cameras and uh, a Philips Hue and Wi-Fi access points and stuff that are more uh, consumer-grade IoT. Um, so now I'll go through uh, a list of attack scenarios and stuff that we implemented uh, so that we can show some of these uh, scenarios in, in, in practice, uh, what are their effects and, and, uh, and, and how to achieve those, those things. So uh, we started as... as almost everybody who starts looking at smart buildings by looking at the BACnet protocol because it's really one of the major protocols used for interoperability, interoperability in the systems. It's one of the, the most used protocols in, in, in building automation. Uh, it's, it's, nowadays it's infamous because, yeah, it's a clear text protocol. There's mostly no authentication. Uh, because of that, there are all the security threats, right? Or you can use it for recon reconnaissance. Uh, sp you can spoof devices. You can tamper with, uh, with uh, variables, for instance, temperature set points or, or, um, or, or inputs and outputs and all that. Uh, you can do denial of service easily in, in, in many of, uh, of these devices. So if you look at the right-hand uh, side there, it's one of the parts of the, of the lab that I showed before, and uh, the house there, the little doll house, is simulating a smart building where on the upper floor you have a motion sensor and a light, and on the, on the lower floor you have um, a thermostat and a fan. And on the right-hand side you can see a, a, a lot of devices there. There's a network switch and there's an HMI that's used to, to program the the BACnet devices, and there's another uh, touchscreen device, which is actually a Raspberry Pi simulating an attacker. 
and then on, on top you can see some uh, some backnet controllers. So the idea is that the usual functioning there is uh, yeah you, you have a temperature temperature set point and then if uh, if the temperature ever goes above the set point the fan uh, starts working and then if it uh, lowers down the fan stops working and when there's a presence detected in, in, in the house there is uh, the, the, the light goes off but you can you can usually uh, uh, easily um, DOS uh, the backnet router which is the the device the, the blue device in, in the middle uh, there on the top, and the the effect that you have when you run the, the a simple DOS, so you, you're basically just flooding the device with with many packets, and you can see the, the packets being sent there by the attacker, and you will see that basically the, the router uh, will stop working, and then the error LED will go on, and yeah, that means that the device is not active anymore, and then it should be controlling the light, but it, it, it doesn't, right? So the light doesn't work anymore. So this, this in, in this case, is controlling the lights, but it could be controlling HVAC or, 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 or any other of, of the subsystems that I that I mentioned before. So okay, we, we can do that with with uh, with using the backnet protocol and with uh, with um, building automation devices. Uh, but then we we wanted to look at another attack scenario, which is. Basically, okay. If, if we have uh, many vulnerable devices, can can we can we create a, a, a chain, uh, uh, an attack path, for instance, where a remote attacker could could reach the the, the devices that are actually controlling, for instance, the the access control um, a function in this case. So another thing we did is we, we, in that lab we, we did some vulnerability research. We disclosed some CVEs we found around, if I'm not mistaken, eight CVs, um, and most of them were actually related to the web applications running in these devices, so I, I think almost all of them had uh, cross-site scripting and some of them had uh, command injections. This is, this is very common in this kind of, of, uh, of environment. And we also found uh, a buffer overflow that allowed for remote code execution. So we basically chained uh, uh, an attack where, where the steps are, are, are those uh, on the bottom there. So we first we gain access uh, remotely using the, an IP camera. Then we perform some lateral movement to the, the management workstation. Then from there we, we move to the uh, access control uh, PLC using the, the buffer overflow. We execute our payload over there, and then we the, the idea is to persist also in that. And that that uh, was achieved basically by uh, exploiting mostly the the, 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 the access control PLC, uh, which has a, a web application and a, a specific uh, building automation framework, uh, Java framework running on that, and runs on top of the QNX uh, operating system. So once we have that buffer overflow, we we can basically live off the land there on the on, on the device and use some of the the devices on on functions to upload our uh, our malware and and, and persist uh, and then implement our final attack which is to open or or or, or close doors depending on whether the the, the what, what we want to achieve right so for instance here you can you can uh, um, allow unauthorized people to access uh, sensitive locations, imagine that in a hospital or in an airport or something like that, or you could also uh, not allow somebody to access uh, a specific location. So for instance, you, 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 you combine both attacks and you have a, 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 an HVAC uh, not working in the, in the data center and then you, you lock the door and then the, nobody can go in and, and fix the issue, right? Uh, so then we, we actually looked at how many of those devices can be found online? And this this is data from last year, so this this we did last year, uh, and we saw around 23,000 uh, devices of the, the ones the same uh, models that we we were looking at in our research, and we saw that around 40% of those, almost 40% of those, were vulnerable to the the, the remote code execution, uh, the, the buffer overflow, and the and the remote code execution that that we found. So that means that there. Are there were almost there were more than the 9,000 devices uh, available on the internet. That's that's from Shodan, that could be could be completely owned from 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 the outside. Uh, so then we we saw okay. So we we, we have uh, problems with the protocols. We have problems with the devices in the in the building automation side, right? In the in the in the, in the older stuff, let's say, and we have a lot of those available uh, online. But what we have what we really can easily find online are 
IoT devices and consumer grade IoT devices and, and uh, smart cameras, for instance, and 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 um, and other uh, such kind of devices. So. Uh, we wanted to look at this at these IoT devices and what are the, the impacts that they have on, on, on smart buildings. So in, the, in this attack that I described now, we use the, the IP camera, for instance, as, a, as an entry point. But what else could we do with, with, uh, with the IP camera, right? Or with the lighting system and all the, the other systems that I described. So the, the next three scenarios are about the, the IoT in smart buildings. So our goal was to investigate the IoT protocols and devices used in a smart building. So some of the examples of, <coughs> sorry, the protocols and devices uh, that I'll be talking about in the next scenarios are RTP and RTSP for video surveillance, uh, the Philips Hue Smart Light for the, the lighting system, and MQTT for the IoT system. And we, we divided our findings there in, in, in three categories. So things that we found on the field. So basically by, by talking to, to customers and partners and, and by looking at the, at the networks of these customers. Uh, things that we found on the web, mostly on, on, on Shodan, and things that we found on, on, on our lab. So the setup of, of the lab is, this is just a simplified version of the, of the same figure that we had in the, in the beginning. So we have the, the video surveillance system, the IoT system, and the smart lighting system. So uh, let's talk about the findings on the field. So when, when we look at uh, smart building networks with consumer grade IoT devices, what how are these networks uh, configured in practice, right? So first thing we, we realize is that many times these in internal networks are not well segmented. So you, you do have like one switch that, that has uh, IP cameras and IT devices and, and, and OT and, and building automation and, and everything talking to each other, not well segmented at all. So you have unwanted communication links between all these uh, all these categories, right? IT, OT, IoT, caused by yeah misconfigurations. Uh, there are many unwanted services and insecure protocols uh, enabled, so it's it's easy to find Telnet, FTP, UPnP, and many times the the the, the facility managers or the people who are who are managing those networks are not even aware that those things are are, are activated because they come activated by default. The uh, the um, the insecure protocols come activated by default, and then and, and that's it. Uh, there are many times weak passwords to access devices. Uh, there are devices with known vulnerabilities. Uh, and there's a lot of use of unencrypted traffic. So I already mentioned RTP and RTSP for the video streams, and I'm, I'll talk about this in details. And you also have, for instance, uh, HTTP and MQTT in clear text for, for IoT devices. So then what do we find on the web? Uh, so we were talking about the unencrypted protocols, right? So if we, if we look at devices with clear text or TSP uh, on the web, we, we find more than 4.5 million devices. And those are mostly IP cameras, but there are also uh, other devices that use this, this kind of protocol. If we look specifically for the, the Philips Hue, for instance, for the smart lighting system, we found almost uh, 10,000 devices online. And if you look at uh, clear text MQTT, which is used for, for uh, general IoT, you have more than 75,000 devices. And these data are from this year, actually, just, just from, from last month, because this is, this is one of the latest things that we had been um, looking at. So let's go in details in these this, uh, three next attack scenarios, right? So, Okay, let, uh, just in, in general, what are the findings of the labs then? Uh, so th again, we th this is the lab that, that we had before. Uh, now we, we, we have an internal attacker. And what we want to achieve there is for the video surveillance, we want to do a footage replace or a Hollywood style, you know, heist movie kind of scenario where you, you are, we are showing one thing to, to the security operator, but actually the camera is, uh, is, is uh, streaming something else, so you can uh, steal something from, from the bank. Uh, in, the, in the smart lighting system, you can just basically cause a, a denial of service uh, to, to make the lights go out or, or, or go on or, or, or on and off uh, continuously. Uh, you can also use, in, in the case of the, of the Philips Hue, something that's interesting, you can just reconfigure the platform to use that as a pivot point inside of the network. And in the case of MQTT and, and, and IoT devices, you can use that for, for instance, information gathering and, and denial of service. And these are the attacks that we, uh, that we implemented. So for the, the attack scenario number three for the video surveillance system, 
uh, again, this is just a simplified version of the of the of the other picture. You have the IP cameras that are uh, using RTP and RTSP to communicate with the network video recorder, and the network video recorder is connected to the network switch, and then you have a storage server and then local monitoring uh, to 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 look at the at the video being streamed, right? Uh, so what's the problem with RTSP and RTP? So they are they are streaming protocols one one is uh, uh, over usually over TCP the other one over uh, UDP one is to, to send the data the other is to, to control the, the the session basically RTSP is is very similar to HTTP uh, and it, it's used to control the stream and it's it's basically mandatory to to, to establish a session before you you start streaming uh, uh, via RTP and RTP is, is designed for a real-time transfer of uh, uh, usually audio and, and video data it's unidirectional from a server, which is the camera, to a client, which is a network video recorder. And there are secure versions, and you can uh, use the TLS, for instance, but this, this is rarely used in practice. Um, so what, what is the anatomy of an attack here? So because you are using these unencrypted protocols and you, 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 you are uh, internal in the network, you can just establish a man in the middle eavesdrop the traffic and record the video footage it's 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 uh, unencrypted it's it's uh, clear text you can replace uh, uh, a, a heartbeat rtsp command usually it's a get param command with a tear down so you you stop the the connection between the camera and the nvr and then you just basically tell the, the camera to stream somewhere else and then you you start streaming your pre-recorded footage to to the nvr so you replay a, a pre-record pre-captured stream to the nvr so in practice this is how it looks like so you have the surveillance footage and this is what the camera is uh, normally streaming and then in the attacker machine you run attercap to to uh, do a man in the middle so you select uh, the hosts And then we have another script which is actually uh, recording the, the footage and replay in, replaying the, the, the pre-recorded footage when the session is, uh, is stopped. Yeah, and now basically the, the, the session with the camera has stopped. And then now you're, we are uh, replaying something that was captured before, right? And then on the bigger screen, you can see what is actually going on. And on the smaller screen, you can see what the, the, the security operator or the, the surveillance uh, guard would, would we be looking at, right? Uh, so this is another attack scenario, uh, attacking the Philips Hue. And the Philips Hue is interesting because it's, it's a very common IoT device which until last year didn't support HTTPS at all. Uh, it was only uh, supporting HTTP. And uh, a, a lot of people knew about that, and it was very easy to, 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 to attack uh, a Philips Hue. And then they, 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 they issued um, a former update last year. But basically, uh, what is used to, 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 to validate your, your communication with the, with the Hue is uh, a, a token, uh, uh, an authorization token, and that can be just sniffed also from from the network because it's it's in clear text, and then you can you can uh, an attacker can just control the camera, right? So you, you just send a, a put request there for the state of the camera, so you can do on or or, or off, uh, and then the I, I just saw that I have like three minutes left, so I'll, I'll run through the slides. So you can uh, you you can just switch the the lights on or off, and then. As a result, you can have something like this, right? So it's basically the, the light is, is completely unusable. Um, so th the last the last attack scenario that you have is, is MQTT, which is a published uh, subscribe uh, protocol used for uh, for IoT devices, where you have a, a, a broker that that um, that uh, coordinates the communication between a set of publishers and subscribers, and that's used to to exchange uh, uh, sensory information. Uh, telemetry information and also to to issue commands to some devices, and 
again, it, it's usually used in clear text, so you can just passively sniff the traffic, or you can subscribe to some topics, uh, and you can you can use that for, for information gathering to understand the, the, the devices that are in the network. You can subscribe to wildcard topics, so you can see basically every topic that, that, that a broker is, is handling. Uh, it's, it's very easy to do denial of service also because you have a, a, a quality of service that can be increased so you, you, you amplify the attack with, with the responses that, that are required and you can use a very heavy payload so, so it's, a, it, 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 it's, a, it's a very common protocol in, in IoT but again if, if used insecurely it's, it's, it's very easy to, to attack it. Um, so with all this uh, in mind, with all these uh, scenarios of attacks, let's very quickly talk about defending the IoT. So the things that, that we uh, we should do so that those attacks are, are, are mitigated, right, or, or, or cannot happen. So the first thing is that we need network visibility. So you need to know what, what devices are on the network so that you can uh, know if they're vulnerable or not or what kinds of protocols they are they are talking, uh, uh, what devices are communicating to, to what other devices and so on. Uh, which allows you to do proper asset management, right? So proper configuration and patching of the devices. Uh, network segmentation is extremely important, so you can isolate problems uh, and reduce the attack surface. Sometimes there are devices that uh, are difficult to patch, so at least they should be segmented. Uh, and as a last point, network monitoring intrusion detection, right? You should basically know uh, what's going on at, at the network in, in real time and be able to, to spot anomalies uh, and, and, and attacks happening. Uh, so more details about these attacks and about the defenses and all of that are in uh, four papers that we, 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 we have over there. The first, the, the, the top two papers are actually uh, uh, academic publications. Uh, and they deal mostly with the backnet stuff, um, and they deal mostly actually with the with the defensive side, so how to do uh, intrusion detection for for backnet. But th we also describe the the attacks. And the two white papers in the bottom are are, uh, are commercial white papers, so they they, they describe um, most of these attack scenarios that that I showed here, and also a little bit about uh, about defense. Uh, so what are the, the key ta takeaways from this talk? Uh, abusing the IoT in smart buildings, are, it, it's easy, it's cheap, uh, can have severe consequences, right? Like we, we, we've seen with, uh, with HVAC, with uh, um, uh, uh, access control, where you can, we can, you can let the, 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 the attacker basically do physical intru intrusions. And defending the IoT in smart buildings, it's, it's doable, and it starts with understanding what's in the network and, and, and monitor, right? And uh, as a last takeaway, uh, I, I just want to say that uh, the, the building automation, uh, yeah, okay, so um, uh, just the last thing, the, the, the building automation technology is, is, is old, but we are moving to, to more uh, connected smart cities and connected everything, so we should always keep in mind that more connection means uh, an increase in the dark surface and the consequences of these attacks also. So sorry if I went over time. Thanks.